I want to talk about the new age of liberation that leads us to true freedom, true peace, and true happiness. And it's, it's here. And uh, God, through the divine principle and blessed families, will fulfill the purpose of religion and science. So I want to talk about the, today, I want to talk about the fact that all around us now, in this age, there are so many things happening. There's so much information and so many people who are having certain kinds of experiences in their life. And uh, people are more and more being guided and led toward uh, a correct, I believe, a correct view of life and to being led to having many experiences. So in the Divine Principle book, it says very clearly, Human beings become complete only when their spirit self and physical self are unified. Hence, the experience of divine inspiration gained through spiritual cognition and the knowledge of truth obtained through physical cognition should become fully harmonized and awaken the spirituality and intellect together. It is only when the spiritual and physical dimensions of cognition resonate together that we can thoroughly comprehend God and the universe. This part of the divine principle is telling us it's not just about religion. If you are a very religious person, you pray, you believe in a particular faith, you go to church every Sunday or the mosque or whatever it is, you're never going to completely comprehend and understand the real God, the living God, because the spiritual is only one part of our reality. And our physical reality, the, the logical, reasonable part of ourselves, the material side of ourself, is just as much a part of God's creation and just as important. God thus assists ignorant fallen people to elevate their spirituality and enlighten their intellect through spirit and truth. By these means, God conducts his providence to restore people to the original state before the fall. In the course of history, people's spiritual and intellectual levels have gradually been elevated due to the merit of the age in the providence of restoration. Hence, the quality of spiritual experience and the depth of religious and scientific knowledge have risen accordingly. So one thing I really love about our movement, love about true parents, love about the divine principle, is that it is very logical, very reasonable, very mathematical, and it includes a profound and deep explanation about physical reality and respects and honors and appreciates our material world and doesn't just uh, you know, brush it off as being something that interferes with our life. So fulfilling the purpose of religion the fall of man and the history of restoration through indemnity. These two parts of the divine principle are central in understanding uh, the meaning of all religions. So let's look at our fathers at the commencement address in 2001 at the Unification Theological Seminary. He said there are many representatives from different religions, but they have to study how to liberate God because they do not have teachings about it in any of their religions. I may mobilize the founders of different religions because I want to bring together many young people from various religions, like Confucianism, Buddhism, Islam, and so forth. With the permission of their founders and heads of their religions, they can come here and study how to make the entire world one family. That is the meaning of unification theology. All religions should be 
united and make joint efforts for the establishment of one global family. In order to realize this, all existing barriers among races, religions, denominations, and nations must be broken down to create one unified world. The Unification Theological Seminary was founded based on such an interreligious, international, and interracial ideology. God goes all the way, even to his death. That's the way God has been carrying out the providence through establishing different religions. But these religions, instead of becoming one, became adversaries. Yet now in the spirit world, all these saints, the founders of the major religions, become one. They are all united, centering on Reverend Moon. The four major religious founders are now communicating with one another, on which foundation God's authority is also being manifested to the entire world. I'm telling the incumbent president of UTS to create classes on Confucianism, Buddhism, Islam, and so forth, so that by the time students graduate, we will have taught them precisely about God and the spirit world. Confucianism, Buddhism, and Islam, all those courses should be provided at UTS. But somehow they were taken away. You don't have those courses here, do you? Super denominational. Super religious courses are not here in your school. You have to create those courses again. It doesn't matter whether people are Buddhists or Muslims. They should all be united. Even if they have to sacrifice their own religion, they have to come forward and follow true parents. That's the way we can secure liberation on earth. So, you know, all of his life, Father sincerely, you know, loved people of all faiths. And we, too, have to be careful that we are able to really open our hearts and embrace people of all faiths, of all religions. In this day and age, I've many times talked about people like Dr. Bart Ehrman. These are people who are breaking down the walls. They are revolutionizing the way young people are thinking about religion. On some levels, this person is very anti-Christian to some Christians because he challenges the traditional beliefs. This is his most recent book, How Jesus Became God. He's basically explaining what True Parents taught us 40 years ago about the mission of the Messiah, that Jesus isn't God, that Jesus is actually a real person, and that he had a, a, a very reasonable mission to accomplish. Of course, Dr. Ehrman doesn't understand these details because even though you know, I gave him the Divine Principle book, I don't think he's read it yet. But the point is, he gets it to a certain degree. And he's out there on the front line as a professor of theology at UNC, but also he he, sometimes he's interviewed by Time and Newsweek magazine when they have questions about uh, religious stories that come up. So how do we relate to this kind of a person who in some ways seems to be stealing our thunder? And then we have other books by interesting people. A young four-year-old boy created a, a, a storm in his family, in his community, when he had a near-death experience. And not only was this a book, it became a movie. But even you can go to the movie right now at the Blue Ridge Theater and watch it. It's a wonderful story about how a small Nebraska community is challenged by a miraculous experience that one little boy has. And it's all about the spiritual world. It's called Heaven is for Real, but it should be called The Spiritual World is for Real. Because that's really what the whole story is about. Very controversial confrontations about religion. It's interesting, just this morning, I was taught, we were talking to Shana. You know, Shana's and Tobias, and uh, they're moving now out of Clermont-Ferrand in France, and they're going to stay at, at Tobias' family's house for a while. And she said, oh, Dad, we saw the movie Noah last night. 
She told her this this morning. She, I, she said, yeah, Dad, I'm sorry to have to say most of us didn't like it very much. <laughs> I said, that's okay. I understand. It's a, it's a very unique and unusual movie. But the point is, movies like this, people talk about this. They discuss it. They debate it. They argue about it. People of faith, people of no faith, atheists, you know, movie people, uh, just your average person. So here we have an effort that is going on in our world. We can see the attitude toward religion and toward uh, the teaching about the Bible and about Christianity and the role of Christianity and the position of Christianity. Even look at what's happening in the Middle East. You know, again, the confrontation between the, the Palestinians and the Jewish people constantly and continually going on because there's no real solution until people really study the divine principle and understand the deeper reality of God. But what about the other side, fulfilling the purpose of science? The principle of creation. You know, when I think if you're like me, the first time you come to the workshop and you begin to study the divine principle and you hear dual characteristics and four position foundation and you see those, you know, the, the drawing of the four position foundation and give and take action, then if you are a religious person like me, if you, you thought, you know, well, what's this about? You know, this is not in the Bible. What's, what are you trying to say? You know, but as we study the principle of creation more and more, we realize it's really going very deep into what science has already been discovering. There are people, this is a very famous uh, uh, scientific philosopher, basically. In this particular book, he gathered the writings and the, the papers and the speeches of some of the most famous people, like Einstein and you know, these very famous physicists and scientists. And he could see you know, that they're very spiritual people. And of course, in most recently, I've spoken about it before. You know, this concept of the Big Bang Theory. Only in the 20th century has this become an acceptable scientific, reasonable explanation about the origin of the universe. Now, almost all scientists are forced to accept the premise of the Big Bang. But what the Big Bang is really saying is that there was a very specific and precise beginning of time, of space, of matter, and therefore, what was happening before. It opens the door to understanding the reality of an eternal, infinite, spiritual being, who religious people call God, as being at the beginning of time and space involved in the creation. This is a, an organization called the Discovery Institute. One of our brothers, Dr. Jonathan Wells, who's written many books about evolution and is involved in the whole uh, confrontation between evolutionism and creationism and all of these ideas, he's a part of this institute. This, there's many different organizations and groups of people like this out there that are uh, paving the way and making, you know, challenging the traditional beliefs. Finally, this comes to the main point of my topic today. This book, Proof of Heaven. I read this book this week. I wasn't going to read the book because in my thinking, oh, okay, Another book about a near-death experience. I mean, there are literally millions of people that are having incredible experiences with the spiritual world all the time. So, but I found this book a couple of weeks ago, and I bought it for $2.50 across the street at State University at a used bookstore. And then I actually, I gave it to someone as a way of witnessing to them, and I said, please read the book, and after you read it, we'll talk about it. I hadn't read the book myself. Then I, I read the book this week, 
And I found out this is a really interesting and amazing story for several reasons. First of all, this person is a neurosurgeon. He is a person who spent his entire life dealing with the relationship between the brain and a healthy human being, operating on the brain, and being in a situation where he always he was confronting life and death. And he was also approached many times. There were people that he was about to operate on. And people would have these interesting experiences. And he, they would share them with him. But he grew up not believing in the reality of the spiritual world, of course. He really believed in the traditional understanding of science. This person was born in North Carolina, by the way. And uh, he went to Duke University, and he, his life and his family are intimately connected to North Carolina. That was something that intrigued me. But also, as I read the book and I learned about his life, his name is Evan Alexander III. So his father was also a very famous neurosurgeon in Wake Forest, at uh, one of the big hospitals in Wake Forest. And so as he grew up, he wanted to become a, a, a surgeon also. So he went the same way. And he's married, and he has his own children and his own family. And he loved his parents. But a very interesting thing about his life. He was adopted at a very young age. He never met his birth mother. She, would, she got pregnant as a young girl at the age of 16. And she, in North Carolina at that time in the 1950s, she was just a, a school student. And so even though her, her family you know, wanted to take care of her and the baby, she was put in a position she had no choice. She had to give the baby up for adoption. And in those days in North Carolina, the, it was always hidden. You know, once the baby was taken away from the young mother and was put up for adoption and another family got the baby, then it was very difficult to, for, the, you know, for the parents or the, ba you know, the baby that grew up to actually go back and find the records of their original family. So in his story, he was always had this sense of loneliness. Even though he was well loved by his family, he was adopted, but he always had this sense of he wished he could find his family. So one year before he had this experience in 2007, he was able to find his birth mother. And he was very surprised to find out that even though she was 16 years old and, and had to give him up, she actually ended up marrying his father. And they had a family. And so he had two brothers and a sister. But one of his sisters, uh, in 1997, when she was in her 20s, I guess, she died. He never met her, never saw her picture or anything. But he was so happy to find out that he had another family. But then, in 2008, he suddenly, with no understanding by any medical reasoning, came down with a case of E. coli, meningitis, spinal meningitis, and he got a severe case of it, and none of the doctors and none of the, certain, none of the people that, that studied it could figure out where it came from and how he got it and why it was just destroying his body, and he instant, almost instantaneously went into a coma. And he was in that coma, well, I'm gonna let him tell the story because he can tell it better than me. I'd like to watch a, a short presentation of his speaking, and then I want to talk about the implications. Thank you all. It's such a joy to be here today. Um, I would like to share with you some of the uh, backstory behind Proof of Heaven. And uh, I think um, 
I, mu I must confess that uh, Ptolemy is the real kind of literary and academic scholar among us. I am simply the neurosurgeon who happened to have this experience. And it is one that uh, after it happened to me five years ago, uh, I was very much transformed as are many, tens of thousands who have reported near-death experiences, millions of others who have had very powerful spiritually transformative experiences. And yet, my whole memory of my life before all my knowledge of brain, mind, consciousness had been deleted because of this illness, this very special illness, severe bacterial meningitis, um, and a very rare form of it. And that was important that I had that deletion of all of my life before. And it gave me a near-death experience that had a few peculiarities to it, especially that I was amnesic for my life before coma, for my Eben Alexander's personal experiences, all my religious beliefs, my scientific knowledge, all that was erased deep in the middle of coma. And yet I had this profound near-death experience, spiritual journey, that when I first came back was the only thing I knew, was all of where I had been and the beauty of that journey, the ultra-real aspects of it. And, um, of course, my doctors had no clue how I'd come back. And they would just pat me on the back and say, well, we have no idea how you've come back. We have no idea how you could have had any experience. In fact, we have the evidence that your neocortex, the outer surface of the brain, the part that makes you human, that that was very badly damaged during this meningitis. So you can forget about all of that because the dying brain can do all kinds of tricks. Well, it turns out that... I believe them. We, we tend to believe our doctors. Um, and like I said, all of my medical knowledge and, and every bit of my knowing, in fact, even my words and language had been completely wiped out by this disease. They came back rapidly as I came back. Words and language came back over hours and days. Memories of my childhood uh, came back over weeks. Memories of everything I knew from 20 years experience in neurosurgery as an academic neurosurgeon took up to eight weeks to come back. And during that time, I was very busy recording all of what I remembered deep in coma. Because I figured since my doctors told me there was no way it could have happened, but I knew it had happened, that it had to tell us something about consciousness at some deep level. And that's when I started to hit the wall, going through all of that experience and trying to bring it into focus. Um, I would like to just kind of portray the arc of that journey, tell you a little bit about who I was before. Uh, I grew up in a very scientific home. My father was an academic neurosurgeon who trained other neurosurgeons uh, in North Carolina. I'd grown up, he was very religious. He had been a combat surgeon in the Pacific in World War II, had been through a lot of hardship and difficulty in New Guinea, Philippines, on up into Japan. It was his belief in God that got him through all that in one piece. But like I said, he was very scientific. So I grew up in that home with that, that beautiful uh, juxtaposition of science and of religion. Went to a, a Methodist church as a child. But I always knew that science is the pathway to truth. And I'll tell you, I'm more of a scientist now than I've ever been. But I realized that the science what's known as reductive materialism, that I worshipped. That's our conventional scientific view that gained so much strength in the 20th century. I now know that that science is kindergarten level. It's woefully inadequate to explain the most fundamental thing that any one of us truly knows exists, and that is our own consciousness. And it's, uh, it's important to realize the view that I had before my coma is very much a card-toting member of that uh, conventional science reductive materialism uh, thinking, which basically says if you can understand everything about electrons, quarks, protons, atoms, molecules, you know, physics, chemistry, biology, then you can explain everything about the universe. And that science is a trick of smoke and mirrors because it does not tell you about one thing that I think is the most profound mystery known to all of human thought. It's something that's called the hard problem of consciousness. And if someone had asked me before my coma, 
what do you make of the hard problem of consciousness? I would have looked at him kind of quizzically like, well, what do you mean? I had not even really heard of it. And of course, some of my critics out there say, well, he's not even a neuroscientist. He's just a neurosurgeon. And they're right. You know, in neurosurgery, there's not a lot we need to know about consciousness. But I promise you, I've learned a tremendous amount more since my coma that happened about five years ago right now. And uh, that is where it really gets astonishing. I think that's why the book, Proof of Heaven, has gained so much ground in the scientific community. I'm getting asked to give a lot of medical talks about it. Uh, spoke at the American College of Surgeons a few weeks ago. And it's because this world is waking up. And the pure scientific materialism of the 20th century is very important. There are a lot of successes of that science. In fact, I would say I wouldn't be here today if it weren't for three very powerful antibiotics that were part of Western medicine. They helped to save my life. But as my doctors will tell you, they do nothing to help explain how I had a complete recovery. Briefly, five years ago, 4.30 in the morning, November 10th, 2008, I woke with severe back pain. And uh, soon thereafter, my younger son, Bond, those who've read the book will realize Bond is a very appropriate name for him, far more than I knew at the time. Bond came in the room, saw that his dad was in pain and uh, thought he'd make me feel better. And he came up and started rubbing my temples with his hands. And as he did that, I felt severe pain through my head. Of course, anybody with any kind of medical training would think sudden onset of severe back pain, severe headache, maybe meningitis. Well, the doctor was already out. I was gone from this world. My brain was already being overrun by a very primitive, extremely aggressive, and absolutely should have killed me, bacterial meningitis. And it was within an hour or so of that time that I had a grand mal epileptic seizure and I was gone from this world for the next seven days. I remember nothing of it. And of course, the book does contain elements of the story that had to do with my family and all the love that they were there holding my hand 24 and seven, trying to give me an anchor to this world. And all of that I had to glean from talking with them because I knew nothing of the events during that week that I was gone. And I did find out later that I had that grand mal seizure. My family called 911. The EMTs packed me off to the hospital. Uh, the doctor there was a good friend of mine who did not even recognize me. I was so transformed. In fact, she knew when she first saw me, if she do, didn't do something right, that I wouldn't even get out of that emergency room alive. I was extremely ill. And when she, suspecting men meningitis, did a lumbar puncture, put the needle in my back, out came thick white pus under pressure. She told me much later that when she saw that, she knew I was dead. Fact of the matter is, if you have a gram-negative bacterial meningitis and you go into coma in anything less than 24 hours, and I was on an express train, I took about three and a half hours to go into coma, that already takes you down to about a 10% chance of survival. That was at the beginning of the week, and it only got much worse. I did not respond to triple antibiotics. They found out the second day there was an extremely rare bacteria, E. coli. Spontaneous E. coli meningitis in adults, somewhere less than one in 10 million per year. And it just got worse through the week. And by the end of that week, on day seven, my doctors knew I was down to about a 2% chance of survival. That time they said best case scenario is that he'll spend a few months in hospital, then transfer to a nursing home, round the clock care, in coma until he dies. So the recommendation on that seventh day, that Sunday morning, was to stop the antibiotics, just let nature take its course. And it was a few hours later that I actually started to come back to this world. A giant shock to my doctors and nurses. To this day, my doctors have no medical explanation for my recovery. And any doctors out there know anything about severe bacterial meningitis will agree. It's a miracle I can put two or three words together much less come back and write a book about it and give talks about my journey. Now, so I said, the thing that amazed me was what was in my mind when I came back, because everything in my life before had been deleted. What did I remember when I first woke up to this world? Well, the original place of my journey deep in this coma was earthworm's eye view, very primitive, coarse, underground. I remember roots or blood vessels all around me, coarse, pounding, monotonous sound, seemed to go on for eons. Good news is, it didn't last forever. I was rescued by this slowly spinning white light with pure white and gold filaments coming off of it. And it provided a perfect musical melody. 
And in looking back on it, and something that guides a lot of my work and research now, melody, music, frequency, vibration provides the key to transcend in those higher and higher spiritual realms. That's why I do the work now with sacred acoustics, with Karen Newell, who many of you will meet this afternoon at our workshop on sacred sounds and how we use various sounds to enhance very deep transcendental meditative states. But on this journey, that melody, the musical notes, were a key to transcending up into this brilliant realm. Now, in looking back on it all, trying to analyze it, the earthworm eye view, that very coarse primitive place where it all started, that was the best consciousness my brain could muster soaking in pus. And that's why if you had asked me before coma, what's next? I would have said nothingness. That's where the big surprise comes in. Because what happened next is my neocortex was being destroyed by this meningitis is the blinders came off. And this slowly spinning white light with a perfect melody coming towards me opened up like a rip in the fabric around me, leading up into this brilliant, ultra-real valley. Lush, verdant, filled with life. And I had no words, no language, no body image at all. I was moving up through it because I was a speck of awareness on a butterfly wing. Now, this was not some butterfly like an entomologist here on Earth could give you genus and species. But butterfly is the best word I have. And that, of course, as I point out in the book, Proof of Heaven is a big problem. Is this is a journey to a place that's far more real than this world. This is the dream compared to that. And that is the eternity, the dwelling place of our souls. And our soul groups, our soul mates, and of our connectedness to all of consciousness beyond the bounds of this earth and to the divine all connected through our consciousness at these deep levels. And of course, if I'd paid any attention to the near-death literature before, I would have had a glimpse of that. But I'd never paid any attention to that. I thought it was all tricks of the dying brain. Pay it no mind. Well, I can tell you that the scientist in me that before thought the brain and material realm is all that exists, that maybe at best consciousness is a, an illusion, an epiphenomenon created by the physical brain, you know, and in the height of the 20th century, psychologists were mainly functionalists and behaviorists who would tell you no one is conscious. In fact, there's still proponents of that kind of thinking today, like Daniel Dennett, who would tell you none of us are conscious. We're all zombies. I beg to differ. I think, in fact, we are all spiritual beings that are eternal, that in fact, when our brain and body dies, our soul or spirit is liberated from the shackles of the physical brain and the mind dumbed down on this side of the veil. The veil is there to prevent us from seeing that other side because it's supposed to be faith-based to some degree. And of course, we, we all have to wrestle in our own mind about what we believe about that and the evidence for it. But I can tell you the evidence from neuroscience and from consciousness studies and from the world of quantum mechanics and the physics of the very nature of underlying reality. If you look at the subatomic world, is very strong in where it tells you to go. It tells you that consciousness, soul, spirit is the thing that exists. That at the core, it's all about divin divinity, that we are all divine and have that connection. Now, in this journey with, on this butterfly wing, coming up into this verdant valley, beautiful, lush valley, flowers, blossoms, buds on trees opening up, rich textures, colors beyond the rainbow with millions of butterflies looping in this wonderful river of life and color. And below, below us, souls dancing, lots of joy and mirth, children playing, dogs jumping. Up above, swooping orbs, golden orbs of pure spiritual beings leaving sparkling trails against a blue-black velvety sky. And chants, anthems, hymns coming down. Once again, those, that music, that beautiful, awesome music providing yet another transition, a portal up into higher and higher realms. And the best thing about that beautiful gateway realm on the butterfly wing was that I wasn't alone. There was a beautiful girl beside me. I'll never forget her, the way she was dressed, her smile, sparkling blue eyes, high cheekbones. And she never said a word, but her thoughts came straight into me. Some of the most beautiful messages of my journey, messages for all of us. You have nothing to fear. You are deeply loved and cherished forever. There's nothing you can do wrong. 
strictly in, in this realm, there's nothing we can do wrong, although given that the ascendance of our souls in that higher realm has everything to do with love, compassion, forgiveness, helping our fellow beings, not just humanity, but all of life on this earth. And we can deviate from that. We are given the gift of free will by that God, that infinite power. Because beyond that realm, those angelic choirs provided the, the portal up into higher and higher realms. Time, as we see it here, collapsing down. But deep time of the spiritual realm, a whole different causality. Far more sensible than just trying to trap ourselves in the illusion of birth to death, material realm, there's all, that's all there is. And to understand this, deep within each and every one of our consciousness, through meditation, centering prayer, the gift of death desperation are the answers you don't have to die or almost die to get this this is all about going into our own consciousness and by being conscious beings you all have the power to do exactly this to go to these realms to come to know the infinite power of that deity who to me was so profound as I went and ascended outside of that gateway realm to something outside of all time and space in the core, infinite inky blackness, filled to overflowing with the love of the divine, infinite healing power in that unconditional love. And this brilliant orb of light that was there kind of as a translator or an interpreter. And yet I would cycle through many, many times. And I finally then was blocked away from that region as I was told I would be. I was told I'd be going back and I'd be taught many things. I had no idea what back was back to. I'd come to believe that back was that earth where my view. And by spinning up the notes of the melody, that took me back into the spiritual realms. Well, it turns out that I then found that I could no longer get in there. But I came back to this world, as I describe in the book, because of love for my son. My 10-year-old son, Bond, who was there at the bedside, he'd overheard that conversation from the doctors, time to stop the antibiotics. They'd protected him from the worst news during that week, but he knew this was bad news. He'd hung around outside the room and overheard that. Came in, pulled my eyes open. I was still on the ventilator, uh, being uh, ventilated by the machine, as I had been for seven days. And he pulled my eyes open, one this way, one that way, pupils blown. Daddy, you're going to be okay. Daddy, you're going to be okay. Daddy, you're going to be okay. I did not understand the words. I did not see him with my eyes or hear him with my ears. I was so far gone in my spiritual journey. But again, by being amnesic for my life before all that time, I had been fearless. That's one of the most beautiful lessons here. We can all be absolutely fearless. There's nothing to fear about death. Fear is what leads to so much of the badness in these lower realms and in the lower spiritual realms. And yet that was the reason I came back, was that sense of connectedness. My love for him is what brought me back. And then I went through a long process of trying to understand this and came to realize that deep mystery of consciousness and of quantum mechanics and of where this is all going. And the way to make sense of it was to look back over 6,000 years of human history and realize that there is a destiny coming together now. And the 20th century was a necessary sidestep. But it's now time for science and spirituality to come back together. And it is all for a reason. It's for a very important reason. It has to do with the fact that we are all connected as one. Not just all humanity, but not just all life on earth. It goes far beyond that. That's a big reason why it's happening now. But it's our connection with each other. The fact that we are stewards for this world. And it is time for a change that is inevitable. It has to do with the human spirit and spirit that we share with all of life coming together to guide us into the next level of awareness. It completely leaves behind the false definitions of dogma that says you, you're either spiritual or scientific. Those false dogmas that separate the religions because at their heart all religions get down and converge to one absolute truth about the nature of who we are. And it is time for the destiny that we face that's in human history over the last 6,000 years comes to a culminating point now. And it's time for that connectedness that we all share and to change this world to fully acknowledge it. And I invite you to join uh, this afternoon. Ptolemy and I will be doing a, a workshop where we'll go much more into the power and the lessons of this journey. And for right now, I want to encourage all of you 
to rise up and accept the glorious mission that we share to come to a much fuller vision of who we all are. Thank you very much. Is he telling the truth? Is he stealing our thunder? So many people now like this. Uh, this is, you know, he basically is proclaiming exactly what we, you know, what True Pop Father has been teaching for 40 years. You know, absolute unconditional love. And that we have to manifest that. And he had a very unique, very different kind of experience. So how do we relate to, to people now? I mean, uh, when I when I read this book, when I when I see meet people like this, when I hear them talking about these experiences they had, then you know, what about all of man? What about the history of restoration through indemnity? What about true parents? Where was true parents? You know, he didn't go into detail, but after he came out of his coma and he started writing down about his experience, uh, before he started to really get public, he was very burdened emotionally by a certain fact. And that was the fact that one, when he was in this realm, he didn't see anybody that he knew. He didn't meet anyone that he recognized that was connected to him personally. He said he saw that girl, but he didn't know her. He talked about seeing people laughing and children having, but they were all strangers. And then as he came out of his coma and he started studying about the near-death experience, and he heard stories about how people had seen their loved ones. And then he reflected back on his life, that he was an orphan, that he was given away as a child. And then he felt, even though he'd had this experience, according to his own testimony, he felt lonely. He said, why didn't I see my father? His father had died four years before. He said, why didn't he see someone that he knew? Then, later, because he had already made contact with his birth family, his uh, birth family sent him a picture of his sister that had died. And he looked at the picture and he didn't really, he felt something, he felt some sense of closeness to her, but he thought, well, of course I feel a closeness to her because she's my sister, you know, we share DNA. And he was, you know, putting her picture in the room. And then suddenly he began to look back at her picture. And he looked closer at her face. And then he realized that was the girl that took him on this journey. That it was his sister who he had never met. And he had never seen her picture. And he looked closely. And he said in his own testimony in a different uh, point, he said, it, I looked at her face, and it was almost as if she was kind of smiling and saying, do you get it now, Evan? Now do you understand? And then he felt complete, because, oh, there was someone that he did know that he had this personal relationship with. So for me, and I think for us, I think our, our movement and, and the, we are being confronted with the reality of God fulfilling his providence now around us. And to some extent, we have to find out how relevant are we to this process now. How, uh, 
what, what can we do to contribute to what's, what God is doing on, on so many deep levels? And how do, we, uh, you know, how do we relate to our own history, to our own relationship with true parents? So I want to, I want to kind of go back to some of True Father's words. Uh, this is from his speech that he gave on the 50 year anniversary of the founding of HSA UWC. And when we really study not just the principle, but when we study our, our true parents' words, we realize there's a certain depth there, a certain profound depth of heart, artistic relationship with God that no one else has quite caught or quite captured. This is the last, uh, the last uh, page of Father's speech. This was 2004 in Korea. Respected guests, it is now more than 80 years since I began my search for such incredible secrets of heaven and began to walk the path to lead humanity. It has been the path of a lonely and pitiful man pushing my way through suffering and difficulties that are unprecedented in the past and unrepeatable in the future. It has been a path that has proven and taught the reality of an omnipresent God. Every one of the six billion people in the world is blind. Though they appear normal, they cannot see even an inch in front of themselves. But this has not kept people from pretending to be philosophers and theologians with respect to heaven's truth, bringing grief to God throughout history. The providence of restoration that sought to live for the sake of God and take pity on God never even had a chance to begin. I cannot count the days I spent in tears and lamentation after I came to know this world of God's inner heart. Who could even dare to imagine the grief-stricken God? He has carried out his providence for thousands, even tens of thousands of years after the first human ancestors, whom he created as his children, and tried to place in the eternal position of his object partners in true love, fell into the path of the human fall. God was sorrowful and mortified. Anger exploded within him, and his heart overflowed with grief as he walked this course. He came as the Father and King of glory, but the enemy Satan stole his throne and his position as parent. Though he was clearly alive and carrying out his providence, people said he's dead, and they mocked and mistreated him. Still he persevered on the path with patient endurance, waiting for the day when human beings would themselves understand the truth. Please understand that it is because God conducts his providence on a foundation of true love, which lives for the sake of others, and on the basis of eternity, that he did not just annihilate the universe and begin again after witnessing his children descend into the bottomless pit of the human fall. With the power of his omniscience and omnipotence, he could have judged the world and Satan at once, smashing them to pieces. Though he has this power, he has chosen until now to absorb all the contempt and accusation into himself. He has placed himself in a prison-like environment because he is our father. Ladies and gentlemen, have you spent even one day before our father God shedding tears of sincere sympathy and repentance? Can you stand before God and close your eyes as if to block out how he bites his tongue and endures humankind that inherited the lineage of the devil and became the tool of Satan? And how he waits impatiently for the day of his liberation and release? This is the reason that my life has been more serious than any other in history. As I walked this faithful course of restoration through indemnity, I had to go the way of the perfection of character in order to stand as the Lord of judgment and determine the sin 
of the devil Satan and judge him. I had to send as many as four of my young children, whom I love deeply, to the spirit world. And I have had to cast even my remaining children out into the wilderness. I stand before you as one who has received heaven's appointment as savior and true parent for the sake of liberating and releasing God. And on that foundation, liberating and releasing humankind. I do not come out of a need for money and power or honor and fame. For more than 80 years, I have lived oblivious to morning or evening, day or night even weathering the coldest winters and harshest snow and rain in order to move as quickly as I could along the heavenly path. Even in the torture chamber where my flesh was torn from my body and I was made to vomit blood, I never prayed for God to save me. Instead, my life has been that of a filial son, patriot, saint, and divine son of heaven and earth who sheds tears to comfort God's heart as he weeps to look upon the tragic state of his children. I left my parents and homeland behind to follow the straight and narrow path to human salvation, that is, the path of true love that lives for the sake of others. My life of never compromising and never acting in a cowardly manner may seem incredibly pitiful and bleak from a worldly point of view. No torture or punishment could make me compromise from the heavenly path. Neither could six imprisonment stand in the way of the true parent's search for his children. As I sat in a cold prison cell and watched drops of water fall from an eave, I pledged to myself, just as those droplets will eventually bore a hole through a boulder, the day will certainly come when these hot tears that fall from my eyes will melt the heart of God, frozen in grief, and liberate and release him. That's how I have lived. It has been a sacrificial course of practicing a love that loves the enemy more than my own children and of offering everything to teach all six billion people in the world. In line with this, I went to America in the early 1970s and announced I have come as a firefighter to extinguish a fire and as a physician to cure a disease. It is important that we understand that more than 30 years later, humanity has entered a new age. Finally, heavenly fortune is settling on the planet Earth. The blood, sweat, and tears I have shed on the course of restoration through indemnity for the sake of human salvation are now beginning to bear fruit. And then I, I skipped a couple of paragraphs. By marking May 1st with the declaration, God's homeland and the peace kingdom are built on the foundation of the realm of his liberation and release. I am completing the spiritual conditions on many levels that are needed for God to exercise his authority of all imminence, all authority, all power, all transcendence. Together with God's liberation and release, a world of freedom, peace, unity, and happiness is spreading across this land. In this respect, there is a special meaning to today's commemoration of the 50th anniversary of the Holy Spirit Association for the Unification of World Christianity, which I established. Heavenly fortune is with each of you present here today. Though our time together is short, you can become people of the kingdom of heaven simply by living according to what I have taught you today. That is, first, live in the certainty of God's existence to the point that you can feel his presence against your skin. Second, be certain of the reality of the spirit world and use your life on earth to prepare for your eternal life in the spirit world. Third, live in attendance to your conscience as you would your teacher your God, or your parents. The flames of true love, now fanned by the spring breezes of the 21st century, are spreading like a wildfire across the earth. Exchange marriages are becoming accepted among young people belonging to traditional enemy countries as a matter of faith. Just as water, air, and light 
will flow to fill even the smallest space. The movement of true love is flowing and covering the earth. Young people of intellect who will inherit God's love, God's life, and God's lineage, and settle the peace kingdom on earth, are now waking from their sleep. So I sincerely believe that true parents really did change the spiritual world. They created conditions to liberate some of the most miserable, you know, I mean, we could go on and on with the adjectives. You know, the, the things that, 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 that Evan Alexander experienced are so beautiful and they're completely real. But there's another dimension in the spiritual world that had to be faced and dealt with. A dimension of incredible sacrifice and suffering. You know, man's inhumanity to man. Human beings have done some things to each other that are unspeakable. And though there are people that were so hurt, so damaged in the spiritual world. How to help those people? That's the kind of thing that true parents discover. That's the kind of sacrifice that true parents made. So we, who were part of that, we were part of that, some of us for more than 40 years now. But the time has come, as true father is saying, that time has passed. That time is finished. We can grow up and we can accomplish God's ideal free to love, free to become. If we just, you know, like Father said, just know that God is absolutely real, that God is a God of true love. Know that we have eternal life in the spiritual world. Follow your conscience. You know, let God guide you through your conscience. Do the right thing. Now people like Evan Alexander can stand up there and they can proclaim this to the world. And, and we can be sure that, that this world is unfolding. This is our reality. So we who, who come from a past where we had to deal with the difficulty and the suffering and the, and the struggle, we have to let it go. We have to forget it. We have to not even remember. The time is coming when God won't even remember. He won't even remember the suffering. Because there can't even be the memory of it in the spiritual world. Because if it's there, it's taking away from the joy and the happiness that we're meant to experience. So many times when True Father talks about true love, he says true love is a love that gives and forgets that it is given. And then keeps giving. Doesn't look for something in return. That's a very tall order. It's a very big challenge. You know, he talked about heaven, heaven, he had this experience. It was a different kind of near-death experience because he had no memory. He didn't have an identity of himself. Oh, I'm Evan Alexander, I'm a surgeon, I have a wife named Holly, I have a son named Bond, and I'm looking around this place. It was a different kind of experience. And he explained that it liberated him to just experience something directly. The love of, the love of God, the, 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 the beauty of that life, that experience in the spiritual world. So we have to pray, and we have to be very careful. We, we can build on the foundation that has been given to us, but we have to make sure that what we keep and what we hold on to is pure and original and good, and we have to let go of those things of the past that are preventing or blocking or mis you know, not allowing the true love of God 